Hey guys, and welcome back to another Iron Will podcast with me, Shane Warner, and John Chase. So what this podcast is all about is we are trying to get stories from people that have been through a traumatic experience in their lives and came out a different person. Yeah, they have all created an iron will. So what is an iron will? A burning determination that cannot be stopped or hindered by anything. Willing to do anything to get a desired outcome. Extremely resilient. So what we like to say is we like to say, just keep punching. (laughs) Yeah. So each time we interview a person on this Iron Will podcast, that's the types of things that we're looking to get out of them is... We want to make sure that we, we understand their story, what they've gone through, because people have gone through a lot of hard things, right? We want to know how they've, what they've gone through, how they've overcome it, and then what they're doing now to give back. And if you or anyone you know has a story that they would like to share on the podcast, my email address is shawarn at gmail.com. And you can send me an email and we'll get that person on the podcast. Right on. So sit back and relax and we're going to start the show. We had some unfortunate news regarding Hannah Morales and John's going to tell you a little bit more about that. So after all the things that she's gone through and, and uh, being being hit before... Uh, on her bike. She actually just got hit again, um, unfortunately. And uh, she was put into the ICU. Uh, she has a long road ahead of her. Um, we're hoping that um, we can have her on here again at some point. Uh, we just want everybody to you know, put their, their thoughts out and positive energy uh, towards her and hopefully that she has a great recovery. We're not sure the details at this point, but just want to keep a positive mindset and and uh, spread that to her, her direction. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll have her on here again and she can share her experience. Yeah, um, that's just, just unfortunate. Uh, unfortunate, yes. But shifting gears now. Um, so I wanted to introduce this week's guest. He is a 20-year Army vet and my good friend, Doug Myers. Hey, how are you doing, guys? How you doing? We're doing good, man. What's up? I'm doing well. I'm just hanging out in my garage talking to <laughs> two really cool people on a really cool podcast that I've really enjoyed over the last couple of weeks. Awesome. That's uh, really good to hear. So I want you to start off by telling me how was going to school at Spanish Fork High School, home of the Dons. <laughs> <laughs> the Dons. The mighty Spanish nobleman. Um I was not a good student, so (laughs) most people who remember me from that phase in my life um, probably don't have too many positive memories, we'll say. Um, There was a lot of turmoil in my life at that particular point in time. You know, I I don't want to point fingers at anybody, you know, because people are, I'm different than I was 20 years ago, and so people are probably a little different than they were 20 years ago, but um, the biggest thing for me was I didn't have any, there was a lot of turmoil in my life and I didn't have any self-confidence. I didn't really understand um, what I was capable of. And um, with some of the reinforcement I was receiving, I I didn't feel like I was capable of much. So did you have, it it kind of turned in, did you have a father living at your house or? I did. I did. My dad is, you know, he's kind of that older school generation that I think, um, you know, a lot of people can identify with, you yeah. know, uh, talks very little, just kind of put his head down, went to work every day. And he did a really good job for our family, you know, like, I always had clothes on my back, a roof over yeah. my head. Yep. Food you know, was always on the table. Um, you know, and it, it, like any family dynamic, it was complicated, you know, so to, to, to boil to boil an entire family down into an hour-long podcast, I don't know that we would get much farther than that, um, <laughs> you know. But but there was turmoil. You know, my my mother um, experienced a lot of uh, mental health issues, so that very much colored my perspective. 
you know, and I, I just wasn't a confident person, you know, to, to your point. Um, there was a lot of great people too that helped me out. Um, one lady in particular, her name is Carrie Christensen. She was a, uh, she was called the resource counselor, yeah. um, mm-hmm. at, at the high school. And, uh, that woman has made such a deep impact on my life that I can't even begin to, uh, describe or, uh, even know where to stop when trying to thank her for, for all the effort she did. I think she saw something in me and, um, you know, she didn't give up on me. And so, I was able to there in turn not give up on myself. Which yeah, was very that's good. important. Yeah, that's uh, huge. It's huge to have an uh, someone to impact your life like that. You know, it's weird. Like there's a bunch of small little moments where you know one or two individuals can really, you know, just through caring, just through listening, just through you know showing concern and 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 not jumping to rash judgments without the full understanding of the situation. You know, they can make a deep impact in people's lives. And I think most people have, hopefully, have one or two people like that in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Someone to just listen. You know, I I actually, I I really like that. I want to kind of expound on it just for a second. There's there's a, sometimes those people, they impact us, but it might not even be right when we know them. You know what I'm saying? Like, I had some people... Throughout that time, yeah. like 18, 19 years old, that really impacted me. But I didn't realize it until, you know, 10, 15 years later. When you looked back. When I looked well, I back. Didn't and either, and I didn't yeah. And I fought it the entire way. Like, you know, that, sure. you're going to make me better. <laughs> dragging me down the hall, kicking and screaming on my way to, you know. But, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't, I, I can't um, punctuate enough, like, how important, you know, those critical teachers and coaches and you know just really it can be anyone you know anyone that that lets you speak and um listens to you it's just there's something really um powerful when people let you talk for sure agreed i mean i I think being able to express yourself is one way that you can get all of those pent up emotions out you know and and i think you know especially for the generation that, that i'm in you know, boys were encouraged to, boys don't cry, right. don't complain, don't whine, you know, you know, you, you just, you just put your head down and you bowl through stuff. And, and in some cases, yes, you need to do that. Like that's an important character trait to have. Yeah. But there also needs to be another side where it's you're able to dichotomy. have your feeling about things. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So tell us about, so, so low self-esteem, low confidence, all that kind of stuff. Um, What else were you struggling with at that time? Um, You know, because of that, I think I, you know, I started to turn to to drugs and alcohol, you know, Um, basically, basically anything that would just kind of, I I could turn off reality and I didn't have to deal with, you know, what was going on. I didn't have to think about things, you know, I could just escape, you know, and Mm -hmm. and from what I understand of addiction, you know, that's a, a lot of people's story is just. I just need to get out of here for a minute. I just need to get yeah. out of my head. Yep. There are yeah. too many things going on in there, and I can't, I can't, you know, like my wife says, um, you know, when she talks about getting overwhelmed, she says, it's like trying to catch confetti. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, and I yeah. think that's a perfect, I yeah. think that's a perfect metaphor for, like, you know, when you are overwhelmed and when things just aren't going yeah. well. What it know, feels got like, yeah. Thoughts floating around. Um, so, yeah, with the, I, I never did anything. You know, I, I never got into heroin or, or cocaine or, you know, anything yeah. well, not until later. But in high school, yeah, I never did any hard drugs. Um, you know, I, I smoked a lot of weed. <laughs> and, uh, As we and do. Drank, yeah. <laughs> and drank almost every day. You know, I was, um, I, I was shoplifting to support that habit. Yeah. Right. You know, so I was, I was really just going down a very, uh, a road that doesn't end well for anybody. Right. You know, I wasn't a productive member of my community and, um, you know, in fact, I, I may have been a drain on my community at that point. I remember telling myself when I went through all that, I was like, you know what? When I decided to change, I'm like, you know what? If there, there's only two ways out of this, it's prison or death um, or, or, or both. And I'm like, you know what? I, I got to do something different. Yeah. And that's why that's one of the reasons I eventually um, joined the army was because I didn't see many other ways out. Sure. I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to pay for college. Like I just knew that. 
And by the time I graduated high school, I mean, I think my junior year of high school, I had like a, uh, a 0.7 grade point average yeah. or something yeah. ridiculous. Like, you know, like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting into school, yeah. you know, so. School, I, I needed to find another way. Your, I needed to find another outlet. Yeah, and I think a lot of people can relate with that. I think people listening can. can oh, absolutely! I think more people can relate with that than about anything. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was just a very chaotic point in my life, and and you know, I needed to find a, a place to escape to, and then the army gave me that that place to escape to, um, yeah. and actually provided a really structured environment that kind of helped. You know, we'll talk about it later, but, you know, in some ways it helped me, in other ways it hurt me. So let's get into you joining the Army then. I think that's the next really yeah. big well, thing. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. There's kind of two stories about that. I joined the National Guard in um, 1997. Okay. Um, when I was 17. Um, this was the end of my junior year, so kind of my rock bottom, basically. Well, my rock bottom at that point in life. <laughs> And it gave me something, it gave me a goal to to pursue that I don't think I had, um, something that I cared about, that I, I wanted to achieve. You know, I was able to, at that point, like, kind of separate myself from some people who weren't the greatest influences on me and, you know, kind of really knuckled down and, you know, actually graduate from high school. Um, because if I didn't graduate, you know, they were going to, you know, they were going to avoid my contract and I, I wasn't going to be a member of that you know, my team anymore. Yeah. And, and I really wanted that. You know, so after I graduated high school, I kind of uh, floated around for about a year trying to decide what to do. Um, I eventually wound up getting laid off from uh, my job at, a, at a, a plant out there. And just, I needed a change. I needed to change the scenery. I needed to change the people. Um, I just needed a drastic change in my life. So I walked into the recruiter's office and said, um, hey, how soon can I go from National Guard to full-time Army and sign me up? Two weeks later, I was on the road to Colorado. That happened relatively quick in my uh, instance. I know some people's story is a little different. Yeah. Did you have to go to Colorado to um, get a new MOS, or did you just keep your old MOS? So I initially enlisted in the Army as a combat engineer, and I was able to keep that MOS. I had already been MLS qualified, um, you know, during the previous two years. So I was able to just, you know, pack up my car, you know, say goodbye to the family and, uh, and drive out to Colorado Springs, Colorado and, uh, uh started my first, uh, unit, the uh, fourth engineer battalion. So, um, you went to that battalion and then that was your first one in the active duty army side. Yeah, so I've been to a handful of uh, active duty uh, assignments over the course of 20 years. I started out in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, I subsequently, uh, after a few mistakes, um, got sent to, we'll talk about those here in a minute, but um, got sent to uh, South Korea, a place called Camp House, um, for a year. Um, then went to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, then I became a drill sergeant and uh South Carolina. Then I went to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, and I finally ended my career last year uh, up here at Fort Lewis in uh, Washington. So you joined the Army in, well, the National Guard in 1997, right? Correct. And then, so a couple of years, what's that? Yeah, 1999. Okay. 1999 was when I went from Guard to active. Okay, that's before September 11th. And yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody remembers where they were on September 11th. I yep. just got done doing PT, and my buddies came over. We watched the second plane hit the tower, and uh, everybody kind of looked at each other and was like, "We're going to war." What was? Yeah, yeah was what really was happening. the feeling like? Can you explain kind of what that felt like to now know that you're going to war, and we haven't yeah. hadn't been to war for so long, and well, it actually took me a while to get to Iraq after that. Okay. Um, but uh, in, in 9-11, when that happened, I think previous to 9-11, it was kind of like being on a football team that uh, practiced constantly, yeah. Um, yeah. but never played a game. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And and uh, and then 9-11 happened, and it's like, holy shit, it's game time, and we're going to the Super Bowl. 
Yeah. Like it was immediate. They're just the, yeah. the switch. To that that had to be the craziest it was, it was game on. Yeah. There's not even a warm up game like a play, <laughs> yeah. play some, you know, <laughs> a smaller. Screen. No, no. It's, it's, <laughs>